All right. Well, we are at a few minutes after one. People are still joining, but given the fact that there's a lot of material to present, I don't want to wait too long to get this started. So I think I'm going to get started. I'm Mike Paglione. Uh, I work at the Technical Center. I'm the manager of the Software and Systems Branch under, in the Aviation Research Division at the Technical Center in New Jersey. Uh, as you can see on the screen in the flyer, we have two really wonderful speakers uh, lined up. Uh, Mary Moulton today, which I'll introduce her in a few minutes, and she's going to be talking about library services and publishing FAA documents. Uh, and she's from the National Transportation Library. And then we also have Leighton Christensen next week at the same time, next Wednesday, and he's going to do a deep dive in public data access. So uh, I'm really, really excited about their talks, and I hope you are too. So uh, with that, uh, we'll get started. So I'm going to ask Anthony Tavarianis, uh, Dr. Tavarianis, to give a little bit of a background on the initiative and um, the motivation of, of, the, of this work. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah, this is our second of uh, three events that are focused on research library services. Uh, and these events are being brought to you uh, as a result of an ongoing uh, collaborative initiative between the William J. Hughes Technical Center and the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute. Uh, the goal of this initiative is to cross our lines of business uh, and make the two research organizations essentially bigger than the sum of the parts so that uh, we benefit our mutual missions, the agency, and improve aviation safety. And, and Mike and I work on what's called the Knowledge Transition Project, uh, along with Anton uh, Koros. And our first activity um, in this, the lectures today is to increase the awareness of uh, research library resources, which we did a couple of weeks ago, both within the FAA and the Department of Transportation, um, as well as familiarize researchers with the National Transportation Library resources. And, coming looking next week and complying with the DOT public access plan, uh, which was actually mentioned by the, the secretary um, as an emphasis item. Uh, subsequent activities um, over the next coming months and year, um, we're gonna be looking at developing a joint uh, website for sharing our collective aviation safety research uh, programs, as well as uh, transitioning our research project outputs. Uh, and then we look to build on that eventually to facilitate data sharing and research collaboration with folks outside the FAA. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Mike. Thank you, Anthony, for giving the overview. Um, now I wanna introduce our, our really uh, great speaker from, from the DOT, Mary Moulton. Mary Moulton joined the National Transportation Library in 2011, following a career in academic and private sectors. As the digital librarian, Mary, Le Mary leads the development and enhancement of digital repository services, information organization, digital curation, and discovery and use of the NTL, National Transportation Library's resources. Mary is the co-chair of CENDI, an interagency group of senior scientific and technical information managers from 14 United States federal agencies. Wow and a co-chair co of Science.gov Alliance. Science.gov, by the way, is a federal public access portal that searches over 60 federal agency databases. Mary has a BS in plant science, an MLIS from University of Rhode Island, and an MS in entomology from Kansas State University. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna give it over to, to Mary. Thank you, Mary. Can you see my screen? N now we can, it's starting to come up. Yep. Okay, great. One thing I forgot to mention, and I'm, I'm sorry about the interruption. Uh, if you have questions, please post them <clears throat> in the QA box in the bottom of the Zoom. Uh, we will be taking those questions and we'll we'll bring it over to Mary at certain points in the in the presentation. So please, uh, you can go ahead and post them uh, as you see fit, and we'll bring them to Mary's attention. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, hey, everybody. Um, good afternoon. I'm Mary Moulton, and I'm absolutely delighted to be back again today to be able to talk to you about the National Transportation Library 
and specifically our digital services. Um, so to get started, this is just an overview of my presentation. Um, probably some of you were in um, the library day uh, last month where Leighton and I presented as part of the panel of DOT librarians. And I am going to repeat a little bit of that presentation. Um, however, uh, I will be uh, providing a lot more detail because my presentation a few weeks ago was 10 minutes and um, uh, I, uh, I have a lot more to say. So if you're returning, thank you for coming back. And if you're new to this, um, I'm really happy that you decided to join us today. So hopefully uh, this will be informative and interesting. So um, first I'm gonna talk about um, the National Transportation Library. I'm gonna talk about our repository and open science access portal, Rosa P which is our digital library. Uh, I'll review access. We'll talk about collections. I'm going to very briefly touch on uh, data packages uh, uh, to set some context around what we do with the repository and hopefully stimulate some questions you might have uh, for next week when Leighton gets a chance uh, to present about data services. I'll also review digital submissions and also how we're handling um, legacy collections. I'm gonna pause a couple of times during my presentation and that will give you a chance to ask some questions. Uh, I'm also going to um, do a live demo. Hopefully that's gonna work well. Uh, so uh, now I'm gonna get started. Um, a little bit about the National Transportation Library. We actually have um, two legislative mandates that we operate under, um, the Transportation Equity Act for the 21st century in 1998 established the, the National Transportation Library. And basically we came into being so that we would be able to collect statistical and other USDOT information needed for um, transportation decision-making and it would be accessible to people at the federal, state, and local levels. And then in 2012, we had MAP 21, and this really expanded our mandate. Um, it um, uh, mentioned specifically that we would acquire, preserve, and manage transportation information, um, that we would be a central repository for USDOT research results and technical publications, and also serve as the central clearinghouse for transportation data and information for the federal government. In 2013, we had the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Memo. This is also known as the Holdren Memo. And this basically was a memo to all the federal agencies that conduct scientific research and at the tune of more than $100 million a year and requiring all of those agencies to come up with a plan for managing access to uh, federally funded research. It did specifically call out peer reviewed publications and digital data sets. And I just wanna make you aware that we have been since the very beginning, 1998, providing public access to uh, technical reports and, and some data, but um, data was mostly embedded in publications in what we would call a statistical package. Um, so we're gonna get into that a little bit more today and more so next week. Um, there is also the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking that occurred in 2018. And this is really about um, making um, federally funded data open. And Leighton is um, our uh, resident expert on that, and he's gonna provide more details about that next week. So a little bit about the National Transportation Library. We provide access to digital collections, data services, reference and research services, and we also support networking. And these are all spelled out in our legislative mandate. Um, we're an open access digital repository. We've always been this way. All items are in the public domain and available for reuse without restriction. 
This is what our repository looks like. Um, this is the front page of it. I am gonna do a live demo. Uh, we migrated to the new repository in 2018. We went live. Um, we had been, a, if you had ever used, uh, gone to NTL um, before that, and we had a repository that had a very simple user interface, a search box, there really wasn't much navigation. We didn't really have enough, the, the user interface was really very rudimentary. So we're partnering right now with the Centers for Con Disease Control in Atlanta. And um, they host our repository and they um, are responsible for the maintenance and development of, of the platform. We share this platform not only with CDC, but also with uh, NOAA, National, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and um, the FDIC library. Um, so uh, please come and see us. You have, there's the link at the bottom of the page. Uh, we've got some other ways to stay connected with us that you can see on the page. We feature uh, recently added content and we also make available uh, trending content each week. Rosa P is named after Rosa Parks. Uh, we wanted to honor uh, someone in transportation. This is not unusual. Often uh, digital repositories are named after a prominent person. And we also wanted to honor uh, the role that uh, uh, public transportation plays in um, civic life. <clears throat> so I, I'm gonna repeat what I went over a few weeks ago. And, and I don't mind doing this because I got a lot of questions about this. So um, for, from folks who participated in that um, webinar. So um, uh, I, I wanna make sure that we're all clear about this because there are many levels of access. We have open access, we're an open access repository. I've talked already about public access. And then to make it even more complicated, we have 508 accessibility. So what do all of these access things mean and how do they all work together? Um, I'm gonna try to um, uh, demystify this for you. Uh, open access means that um, users have unrestricted access and um, unrestricted reuse of documents. Sometimes these documents are copyrighted under a Creative Commons or similar license uh, type agreement. In the case of government information, information that's specifically produced by government agencies is in the public domain. I, I think there may be a, a very tiny exceptions to that, but for the most part, government information is in the public domain. Um, and uh, so, but, but, the ex but where it gets complicated here is when you start to talk about what publishers do. And these, this is where I got some questions. All right, so let's say you are doing research um, for the government, either external uh, on a grant or you're an internal researcher, and then um, you finish your research project and you submit a research report to the National Transportation Library for digital archiving. And then you might want to write um, a research paper and publish that in a scholarly peer-reviewed journal. Um, uh, and this happens at in universities who contract with the DOT and also some folks uh, within DOT who publish research in scholarly journals. So the way that we deal with that under public access is we require that you submit the final peer reviewed manuscript. And you probably have to notify upfront the publisher that you are going to do this. And I can tell you how this works firsthand because I published an article last year in a peer reviewed publication and I consulted with our attorney, Charles Ducker, some of you might know him, he's an IP attorney, he works for USDOT. And before I even submitted anything, I made sure that Taylor and Francis, the publisher, knew 
that I was going to retain the rights to my manuscript, all was well. I went through the entire peer reviewed process, kept my manuscript, submitted it to Rosa P. Leighton Christensen cataloged it for me. And my today, my, my um, uh, uh, journal article is behind a firewall. So you do have to either pay or your institution has to um, uh, subscribe to that service so that as a user, you can access the uh, peer reviewed journal article that was published by Taylor and Francis, you can access that. But for all other folks who might wanna read my manuscript, they can download and read a copy of that from Rosa P. The other thing that Leighton did when he cataloged that, he put the digital object identifier for the published article in the metadata, in the record for the, 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 the manuscript so that users can then click on that digital object identifier and they can go to uh, the official copy of the journal article if they so desire. So that's how we got around putting um, uh, a copy of a, a, a manuscript for a journal article in Rosa P. We made it publicly available and we satisfied uh, the requirements for the publisher by putting the DOI in the record and directing people to that final copy that's behind the firewall. I know that this is kind of complicated and for the first time hearing about this, it does sound a little bit confusing. So when I, we take a quick break, I'll answer some questions about that. Um, DOT's public access plan covers final peer reviewed manuscripts. If that's a deliverable for your research, or even if it's not, if you're a DOT researcher and you, you, you know, I, you're working, it's part of your work, it's part of your job, USDOT supported you in that effort to write that journal article, you can still submit a peer reviewed manuscript to the National Transportation Library and we will catalog it and archive it and link it to the, um, the, the published journal article. You don't have to publish in an open access journal to be in compliance with USDOT's public access plan. But you do have to make a plan ahead of time. Yes, I'm gonna publish in this journal and talk to those folks before you go through the peer review process and let them know that you wanna retain the rights to your manuscript. So I mentioned that um, Rosa P is an open access repository and um, basically we're a digital platform for research results. You're gonna find out that we do a few other things too. Um, but what this means, because we're an open access repository, it means that access is free, it's immediate and it's permanent. Um, content is available for anyone to use, download and distribute. Um, open access repositories uh, follow the Open Archives Initiative protocol for metadata harvesting. This means that um, search engines and services like Google, Google Scholar, and also science.gov, they can index and they can harvest the metadata uh, for uh, all of the content in our repository. And um, uh, this makes, uh, makes it so that our content is discoverable. And um, uh, many of these services uh, also search the full text. Um, so uh, users have very good access to um, the information that's in our repository. I would also say that at this point, because we have uh, very, we have high quality records and we have very well indexed content that we are really truly competitive within the global information ecosystem. 
If you are looking for something specific in transportation, it's pretty much, it's, it's almost a given that, um, that those items or that content that you're looking for will come up to the top of the search results in a search engine like Google. And that's awesome. And we work really hard to make that happen. So that's definitely one of the advantages of, of being um, an open access repository and adhering to standards and protocols. Um, public access basically means that the public um, can access publications and digital data sets that arise from federally funded scientific research programs. The public is able to freely search, download, and analyze unclassified publications and digital data sets unless um, specified that may, they might have PII. This is very common in, the, in medical research. It's also common in some transportation research because we do some studies um, involving um, human subjects and behavioral studies, especially with safety and that kind of thing. So, so those, though, that material is precluded from the public access plan. Um, sometimes confidentiality or national security um, issues come into play. So those things do not have to be made publicly available. Um, USDOT's public access plan, which has recently been revised and we'll be um, socializing that very soon. Um, uh, the new plan, the revised plan specifically calls out Rosa P as the final destination for all of your research deliverables. The plan that we've been operating uh, under currently does not name Rosa P because we didn't have Rosa P when we wrote the first plan. Um, so that made a little bit of a confusing situation for some USDOT employees. So a lot of things are really spelled out really well in the revision of the plan. So there shouldn't be any confusion about that. And lastly, um, I want to say a word about um, uh, 508 accessibility. And 508 accessibility refers to Section 508 of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this is to ensure that um, everyone has uh, the same access to publicly available information and data, unless, of course, it would impose an undue burden on the agency. So at this point, I have a little disclaimer. Some of the older content in Rosa P is not 508 accessible. It would be an undue burden if we had to go back and remediate all of that older content. The way we get around this is in our collection development policy. We specifically tell folks that if there is uh, an inaccessible document in our repository, we will remediate that content for you and make sure that you can read it. Um, this also, by the way, even ADA does not call out content for being machine readable. In a lot of ways, that's what this really means. It, 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 and if you make that content machine readable, it makes it accessible to search engines. It makes it accessible for um, you know, artificial intelligence projects data mining, that kind of thing. It also ensures that the content has um, provenance. This makes the difference between fake content, con you don't know who did it, you don't know where it originated from, um, because um, uh, content that is 508 accessible has provenance. At the the um, uh, document metadata is filled out, so we know who the author is, we know which agency or organization um, sponsored it, the date that it was created, those kinds of things. Those go on the, the document and they're permanent. And it, they're also machine readable. That is another really big reason to make sure that your content is 508 accessible because that makes it go to the top of the search results when you use a search engine like Google. Um, so we do follow this rule and, and um, I do a lot of work in this area and making sure that our submissions are, um, are uh, accessible. I also want to point out that the um, orange at symbol there on the lower left hand corner is the international symbol for access. And when you see that in a repository or on a document, 
you know that that's accessible content. Um, as far as access in Rosa P is concerned, the majority of the works in Rosa P are full text searchable. And as I mentioned, they're indexed by popular search engines. And um, in addition to those also science.gov. This is really important because science.gov is a single search across all of these repositories. And we're all, all of us coordinate with each other to make sure that um, uh, we're following uh, the rules for public access, um, that we impl implement the same standards and protocols. So that's really important for government information. And it's also really important for transportation because a lot of folks are not always aware of which government agency is doing which kind of research. And a lot of transportation Research is actually interdisciplinary. I mentioned behavioral sciences that can be a part of transportation research, um, as well as urban planning. Um, uh, there's economics. There's you know there's a, a lot of interdisciplinary research. I knew early on when I started to analyze our search logs that. People were coming to our repository and it wasn't a destination. I mean, they weren't, they were coming there, they were being referred there by science.gov and other search engines, and they didn't know that we had that information that they were looking for. So science.gov really solves that problem because when you're searching across all government science and technology repositories, you're getting information from all of the agencies that is very pertinent to you know, your information need. So we wanna keep that going. Um, um, uh, the other thing um, uh, that we um, submit um, content that we catalog to TRID, which is maintained by um, the TRB library, that's the, their bibliographic tool, that a database that you can search and um, it links those bibliographic records to the actual reports. And, and I think they're going to start adding data sets, but it links to the content in um, Rosa P. I mentioned a little bit about our policies. And um, this, these are the types of things that um, we, we, we collect. Um, we, we create things that um, digital content um, uh, uh, that um, is submitted to us by usually by the creators or the research managers. And um, I, Leighton and I both do a tremendous amount of outreach in the course of a year, um, communicating with our submitters about appropriate um, formats, about um, making sure that they use the correct methods for submitting content that they do things like have a technical reports documentation page if that's required. Um, and um, the other thing that we do is that we also digitize content that is of significance to transportation that might have signif national significance that might have uh, also have significance to the history of transportation or the history of the Department of Transportation. Tra just really vital content that's related to transportation. Um, we don't, we used to, in the old days, we used to archive HTML pages and we also used to archive external, we used to link to external websites and all of that, all of those links and things broke when we went to the new repository and our new platform does not handle HTML content. And frankly, HTML is not an archival con, uh, uh, an archival format. So we just don't do it anymore. If we have something that's really critical, the information is in HTML, we migrate that to a PDF document or another stable format and we make a note that we've migrated that to a new format so that we can preserve that intellectual content. Um, that doesn't happen a lot, but we will do that. So you can see on the right, um, the type of digital works that we collect can be text, data sets, images, multimedia, maps, metadata, um, and other collections. <clears throat> we collect across all modes of transportation and related disciplines. 
And our sources of information are USDOT modes, uh, state DOTs, local and tribal road agencies, UTCs, and um, other transportation agencies. And we will collect legacy content, as I mentioned, if it's of historical or national significance. As of now, uh, I, hash, I should have revised this. We have almost 53,000 items in the repository right now. Um, so we do have um, some of our really um, uh, significant content, I would say, uh, is really easy to spot because we put it in um, collections within P. And we have um, BTS statistical reports and data. And those are also broken up into collections. Um, we are part of the Bureau of Transportation Statistics. So that's kind of a really um, important thing that we do is making sure that we archive all the um, statistical packages and other um, um, materials that the uh, Bureau of Transportation Statistics uh, produces. Um, we also have USDOT public access collections. We've set up a collection for every um, mode. And we're also working now on um, sponsored research that goes out to the UTCs and other, um, other specific external um, transportation research programs. But so that's, stay tuned for that. That's, th that's a little bit of a harder lift for us. Um, we did set up a collection for FAA, even though we were only able to identify a few items that for sure we thought should be in a public access collection for FAA. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. And we also have historical collections and this part of the repository is really growing and it's very exciting. So <clears throat> I'm gonna break right here before I go into the demo and um, uh, ask that if there are any questions about what I just talked about that you ask those now. Okay, we do have one question um, and uh, another one that came in. So a number of websites for research groups while wanting to centralize their publications for easy search, still want to advertise their most recent publications from within their group, which creates some duplicate, duplicative efforts publishing PDFs in both places. Have you ever considered creating a web service that can parameterize by subgroup or branch within an agency to create a listing of listing service or website embedded friendly widget, similar to iframe video players or a JSON service that isn't just a simple link to the NTL for an overall search. So I think it kind of overlaps with what you were talking about collections. I'm gonna start and Leighton's gonna finish this question. So first of all, we do know that most of the modes um, uh, maintain their own collection of items. And we are not in conflict with that. We're doing something very different. We're in this for long-term preservation as well as external access because most of, those, most of those modal research collections are not really open and searchable to search engines like Google and Google Scholar. And you know, they don't follow the same protocols, but that's okay because that you're providing a very valuable service to your constituents by maintaining those collections. Um, there are several ways that we can help with that though. Um, and that um, uh, since we always have an archival copy and this has happened several times in my tenure here at USDOT is that websites have migrated and those links have broken or maybe a copy was corrupt or whatever. And we were able to supply the backups for those and also um, new links. So what we are doing in Rosa P, we have permanent links to our content. So that's the, the value add that we provide that we really are an archive and, and uh, we're a backup for you. We're, we're not in conflict with what you're doing. So the other, part of that question, I'm going to turn over to Leighton to answer. All right. Thanks, Mary. And so um, when Mary does her demo in just a second, I am going to ask her to spend a little time and look at collections to help visualize um, what Mary just talked about and what I'm about to talk about. But there is already in Rosa P an FAA collection. And we can create a digital object identifier, a permanent link to that collection that the FAA 
Um, and the research outfits can put that will take people directly to that section of rows of P. And then we can go a step farther. Each research unit in FAA, if they desire, can have their own collection in rows of P with their own permanent link. And the beautiful thing about the way rows of P works is if a number of FAA or FAA and FHWA and FMCSA all work together on the same research project, that single PDF in rows of P can belong to three or more collections at the same time and not do any damage. So if your particular research office at FAA wants its own collection for its own research inside rows of P, we can do that. We do the same thing for the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, our home office. They get all sorts of special treatment because um, they pay us. And so we do lots of nice things for them, but we can do lots of nice things just like that for you. We have a specific collection that we just created in the last two weeks for the historic and the current and the upcoming commodity flow survey, because this is a special piece of data um, and, and survey that we work with the census on that people are particularly interested in. So we can front load, we can surface those sorts of things for you. And again, we can create direct links that will take people directly to that particular collection or that particular special collection. So that no, um, the question that was asked, that's maybe not exactly what you were looking for, but we can get you fairly close to something like that. And so we're very happy to work with you all on that. Um, and it's the sort of thing that we want to do for you. We want, we want to help you drive traffic in the archive where your customers, where your users are going to need it. Because um, that makes everybody's experience better. And I'm going to turn it back to Mary. That was an excellent question. Thank you so much for that. And I think that you're going to see um, during the demo that you'll get some ideas about how this might work. Are, are there any other questions? There's two more questions. Uh, uh, one question is kind of a, a related to the previous one. Do you accept historical documents going back decades perhaps uh, th that we have maybe that never got into our library or something that it would be of interest to people out there? Yes, the, the short answer is yes. And, and that's a continuing effort um, uh, to identify um, uh, items that um, should, should really be uh, preserved in, or in made ex archived and made accessible. Um, I, I have a lot of examples of that. One of the things that recently crossed uh, Layton's in my desk was the um, uh, um, the, the air air consumer. Oh, I'm not going to get this right. The consumer air traffic. Layton, help me out. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on it too. So many things pass our desk in a day. I forgot. It started in. It's a it's a consumer um, air. Uh, Consumer Airline Report. I think you that, mentioned it last that, time. Yeah, that's published on a monthly basis, and we acquire. I, I actually drove out to somebody's house and got them out of his garage. <laughs> they go back to 1972, and Leighton and I have a complete run of them, and wow. they're data tables about um, consumer feedback on on airlines. This is like super valuable information. So, I mean, this is a really good example of the kind of thing that we would collect. And, and hopefully digitize. And um, as far as the data tables go, we are working on, hopefully there's gonna be a technology available soon where we can make those data tables machine readable. That's a little bit of a problem right now, but yes, we are interested in older content, especially um, uh, you know, research related content. We're, we're interested in that. I'm going to get into this a little bit more as I, as I get through the rest of my presentation. Real quick, uh, there there is one more question, a little more specific. Uh, in in 2011 and 2012, the CAMI Library provided a set of CDs with OEM technical reports and, and metadata, along with a link to the website where the reports are housed. Have those reports since been cataloged and added to Rosa P? Is the NTL retrieving the additional reports from OEM report website and adding to, to Rosa P? So it's a little bit of a specific question, but. I'm pretty sure that we cataloged everything that was on the CDs. That happened right as I was hired. Um, so that's quite a while ago, but I think that was like probably one of the first projects I ever worked on. As far as updating that, I don't think that that has happened, I'm pretty sure. So that would be a really good thing for us to partner on and update, for sure. 
Okay. I think uh, no more questions in the queue, but I'm sure more are coming in. And thank you. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you a, a quick demo uh, if I can figure out how to do this. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so this is um, what Rosa P looks like. And um, this uh, area here, we spotlight content in here and we change this throughout the year. Um, right now we're highlighting BTS publications and we try to synchronize this with important events like the annual TRB meeting and make sure that folks um, see that they can download the content that gets um, talked about um, during the meeting. This is the newest thing I just put up this week. Um, we, um, uh, in um, response to the administration's um, directive about um, climate change and resilience and adaptation, um, we went through the repository and identified um, materials uh, related to climate change and um, we created a collection. So we can spotlight here individual items um, or collections. And this is a bit of a carrot um, for folks who are thinking about getting their content into Rosa P. We would love to spotlight FAA content on the front page of Rosa P. And it gets a lot of hits. It gets a lot of attention. People love this. So we will do that for you if you are interested and um, uh, we get some of your content migrated here. So the first thing that I'm gonna do, um, oh, oh, I wanna point out that there's a menu across here. Um, the submit content, instructions on how to submit content. The public access is more information about public access. Um, so basically, I'm going to search the entire repository and I'm interested in um, research on traffic management. So I just simply enter my terms and do my search. And here are the search results. And I want you to notice several things. First of all, I'm getting traffic management about vehicles and cars. And the other thing is the way this is sorted by relevance. Now, sometimes I'm not happy with the way the relevance ranking goes. You can always change that. I tend to like um, publish date and descending order. And that's mostly just because of the type of searches that I do. I'm, I'm, I'm doing searches because I'm checking on, you know, the repository. But you also have these options over on the left hand side where you can select a resource type. So I can look specifically for tech reports if I'm interested in that. And I'm, I'm definitely interested in Oops, air traffic control here. I'm not interested in um, managing cars. So I can narrow this search down this way. And um, I forgot to note there were thousands of results when I did the first search, but I've narrowed that down now to 282 results. And they're still being rendered in reverse chronological order. So I can see the most recently published first. So that's a very basic search. Um, I also want to let you know that there's another way to do this using the advanced search. This gives you um, a little bit more flexibility. I can still search across all collections and I can search different parts of, of the, I can, I can search different parts of the record. Oh. 
So my suggestion is, and, and the relevance doesn't stay, you have to change that, but the, um, um, it, gives you a, it gives you a little bit more control over your searching. So I'm gonna show you something here because I searched on Federal Aviation Administration that a lot of this content is not really new. And um, so um, we are very hopeful that we're going to, in the near future, enter into a partnership where we get a lot more FAA content. It would be great for everyone. It would be great for Rosa P because we're the US Department of Transportation, but it would also be great for um, you, know, you your, your content would really have an international accessibility being in Rosa P. And um, um, I, 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 I think it, it, it would just be, um, you know, a, a, a really, a really good thing. Uh, Mary, I, I can say with 100% agree. So I'm going to try to do that from my end at the tech center and, and bring that up my management chain, uh, because uh, we, we really need to, to step it up and get, get, get our documents in there for, for one very important reason. Access. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. yep. You know, it's a no, it's a no brainer. Yep. I wrote the exact same note. <laughs> so I clicked on collections here, and here you can see our collections. These are the BTS collections that Leighton mentioned. And if you search across the entire repository, you'll pick up what's in the collections. The other thing it's really important to note is that one single item can be posted to more than one collection. So there might be some work that was done um, um, in um, uh, um, behavioral research that uh, NHTSA and FAA might be both interested in that. We can post that to both collections. Um, so the advantage to this is that um, a, you can go into one of these collections and you can do uh, a, a very um, specific search. Now, there are only 14 items that we flagged for FAA, but we set this up just so you can see what it would look like. I'm going to go back, though, and I'm going to show you what is possible if you do a, um, a collection search. So I'm going to go to the Federal Highway Ad Administration. And I'm going to do that same search about traffic management. So this is just in content published by Federal Highway Administration. And then I can start narrowing this down. And it's a lot more efficient to do this this way. Um, Here's what a record looks like. This is really important here. This is all the metadata. These are, this is the value add that um, the National Transportation um, Library provides. You can see the subjects there. Okay, so. There should be a DOI on one of these. <laughs> I picked one that didn't have a DOI. If the document is not too big, it will load into the viewer. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a, a DOI on a subsequent one. Um, so that's the very basic of searching within the collections and um, um, being able to narrow down your search using um, the navigation on the left. All right, I'm gonna pause here and ask if there are any questions. I've got a few minutes remaining and, and not very much left for my presentation, but 
if you've got a question about searching. I also want to let you know that I put slides in at the end of the presentation, extra slides that give really detailed instructions about how to do all these types of searches. There is one question, and it's very related to what you were just talking about. Uh, can we create DOIs in ROSAP for technical reports and other self-published documents like that? I'm so glad you asked that because I'm going to talk <laughs> about that right now. Beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to, um, let's see, what am I going to do? I have to change what I'm... <laughs> sharing, and I have to share something else. All right. Can you see my... Can you see my screen? Yes, now, now we can see. Okay. I see demo slide. All right. Just switch. So this, I'm just going to very briefly touch on this and, and Leighton is going to do a deep dive into digital object identifiers and data in his presentation. But I want you to start thinking about this right now. So, um, Here's what it looks up a, a research a result looks like in Rosa P. If you have searched on um, a, a, a research package that includes data sets, there are these tabs that go across the record, and the data sets will be in supporting files, and you will be able to see them listed there. So those are the parts of um, a research package that will include data sets. It could include a README file. It could include software. It could include additionally a research report. So this is why we went to the new repository platform. So we could link all of these things together and the user will have everything available in one page, in one place. So that's basically what, um, what that looks like. And this is what a DOI looks like. The digital object identifier is a permanent identifier that the National Transportation Library assigns to a single object in our repository. So there'll be a DOI for a research report. There'll be a DOI for an accompanying data set. So, so it's, we don't give the DOI out for the whole package, it's for the elements. That makes it citable and it also makes it so that you go to the landing page for that item. And this is what you're seeing here when you look at the screen, even though this is a screenshot. Um, so that DOI always resolves. It's a permanent URL. So we have a whole bunch of them that we keep in reserve and we save those. And as items come in um, to the National Transportation Library, we assign those to um, the items that we catalog. It's a really involved, there's a lot more to this. Layton's gonna go over this in depth next week. And so this is kind of a teaser. I want you to come back and I want you to learn about this because it's really, really important for what we do. And it's another value add um, uh, that, that um, uh, uh, it, reason why you should get your um, materials into Rosa P. And this is a really good explanation about that. The records have the DOIs in them and we register those DOIs with data site. So there's also an external you know, way to get to um, the items in Rosa P. Um, I should have changed this. I gave a presentation to FHWA a few weeks ago. So what we're current, but, but it's important that you know this, we're currently working with Federal Highway Administration. We're gonna be supplying them D 
DOIs in advance of publication so they can actually put the digital object identifiers on their publications with the recommended citation. We're doing that now for the Bureau of Transportation Statistics reports as well. And this just talks a little bit about the submissions um, process. And basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna use this NTL digital submissions box. And this would be for individual or if you had two or three publications. But if we're gonna do a big data migration, we're not gonna do it this way. We're gonna, we're gonna do it another way. We're gonna do a batch upload. So we'll talk about this. And we expect that you comply with our collection development and maintenance policy, which includes 508 compliance. And um, we'll send a re weekly report of what we upload to TRED. So I just wanna mention a little bit about the legacy content. We're currently in the midst of um, um, uh, digitizing Public Roads Magazine, and this goes back to 1918. And um, this is like really awesome. Um, we got the sample yesterday and they look great. We partner with the Library of Congress and Internet Archive to do this. So we would love to partner with you on some digital preservation projects. I'm sure that you have some really awesome stuff that needs digital preservation. So this is just a little bit of a teaser here. We do have two collections related to um, uh, aircraft and aeronautics. We have the very popular investigations of aircraft accidents and also another special collection on civil aeronautics regulations. And we are currently processing um, manuals and um, federal aviation regulations and um, FAA reports. So look for those in the near future. Um, we have a collection that um, we took out of the former HQ library that was put together by the DOT historian that's already been processed for digitization. This is a picture of the first Secretary of Transportation, Alan Boyd, with um, uh, President Johnson. And as you are probably aware, um, Secretary Boyd recently passed away. We have his papers, we have speeches that he gave. Um, so lastly, we also uh, provide an Ask a Librarian service. And this is open to the public and also to anyone at USDOT. Please contact us if we can do some research for you, help you answer a question. A lot of what we do is um, assistance with Bureau of Transportation Statistics publications and data products. And a lot of that is airline information. So please contact us. Um, we would love to help you with your research. We'd also love to help you with moving your documents to Rosa P. Well, we are, we're at time. Uh, thanks for a wonderful uh, talk today on some, some really important uh, opportunities really for us at the FAA to get our Get our work out there, and uh, you really did get, did do a great job in giving us a deep dive in Rosa P and all the capabilities available to us. and And thanks for that. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to distribute your slides to everybody that logged in, and uh, and we'll get it out there. So maybe you'll get some calls on that Ask the Librarian <laughs> and some of the other uh, contact information there. So thank you so much, Anthony. Any closing remarks? Uh, we're at 202, so we're a little beyond time here. So I'll keep these very brief. Thank you very much. Uh, learned a phenomenal amount. I've got a page of notes. I definitely <laughs> follow up with you about the um, stewardship for documents. Uh, that, that was awesome. I, I, it's a, obviously, there's a huge resource we did not know that was out there. It's well worth the time. Thank you. <laughs> so with that, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thanks again, Mary and Leighton. And uh, next week, same time, a different place, another URL, Zoom, but Lighten's going to be talking about data access as, as Mary queued up. So please come back. Thank and you. Be sure to send your questions ahead of time. I'd be glad to take them. Thanks, everybody. Bye, folks. Bye-bye. Yeah, you can send them to me, Mike Paglione at FA.gov, and I'll, I'll get them to Lighten. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. <laughs>